What's up, Fanversation? Carrie Lane here, and I have the director of Unwelcome with me, John Wright. Welcome, and thank you for joining me. Thank you. Yes. So tell me about this film. It's a new movie coming out in March, and it has some interesting elements to it. So tell me, where did the idea come from, and how did you get involved with this film? Well, it started life as a conversation between myself and my co-writer, Mark Stay, and we were kind of laughing at each other, really, um, at how terrible we were at fighting. And we were saying it, you know, the nice way of saying it is you describe yourself as a pacifist, but really that's um, a, a pleasant way of describing a coward. Yeah. And um, so we were talking about different situations in pubs and clubs and places where we'd been in fights and how badly we handled ourselves and but then we got to talking about our children because I've got a 13 year old son and he's got two teenage kids and we both agreed that if our children were in danger that we would be violent actually and not only would we be violent because we aren't the world's best boxers we probably would grab a weapon and we'd probably be overly violent in the in our desperation to want to finish it off and make it come to a quick and abrupt resolution. So that was interesting to me and to him. We thought, how can pacifists be violent? You know, that felt mm. like a paradox and it felt like sort of a dramatic question. So we asked that question of the two leading characters in the movie, Jamie and Maya, who start off as they're very liberal, urban, metropolitan people who would describe themselves as pacifists. And then we say, okay, are you really pacifists? And we push that question as far as we can, you know. Interesting. And then yeah. what made you want to make this story now? I mean, you were talking about like your own personal lifestyle and your children, but you know, what was kind of that, oh, we should make this now moment? Um, I suppose for me, it was, I've been looking at some of the horror movies that have been coming around and the new wave of horror movies and, you know, looking at stuff, by Ari Aster, like Hereditary and Midsummer, or films like by Jordan Peele, like Get Out, and I, and lots of other films too. And I was just excited by this new wave of horror, you know. It really appealed to me personally. I thought these films are very interesting because they are horror films. They are in the genre. They deliver what you expect of the genre. They have, you know, monsters and creatures and killers and blood and guts and shocks and scares and all the stuff we enjoy, but they also are thought provoking and interesting and they've got something to say and they feel like real movies, you know, don't feel like exploitation in any way. And that was, um, you know, I thought it was really cool and it made me want to make another horror film. So it's kind of looking for something to do, you know, and then looking for a good idea. And, and also I'm Irish, although I don't sound Irish, I've got an English accent, but I was born in Ireland to Irish parents and have an Irish passport and all that. And I love working there and I love visiting there. And, you know, I just enjoy being in Ireland. I have a lot of good friends who are Irish crew. And so I was looking for an Irish idea as well. And that, you know, got us to, I always, my imagination always goes to the fantastical. So I don't really, I enjoy watching films that show me a window on a world that I could never experience or know, you know, that to me is more interesting than seeing the real world reflected. Although obviously there's a place for all that, but I want to see something from my dreams, you know? So we got to reading Irish myths and legends and folk tales and fairy tales. And, and then we found these guys called the red caps who are evil goblins and they dip their caps in the blood of their victims. And that, you know, so we were talking about violence and thought those instantly sounded like uh, pretty violent people because, or creatures, because they, um, there's no apology there, is there? There's no shame in that. If you, if you want to wear, you know, wear your blood on your head as a badge of honor, that yeah. suggests to me that they're, they enjoy their work, you know. And so that felt like the beginnings of something. And that's kind of what the, the genesis of the movie was. Nice. And it's really cool that they're actually there. And that's not a spoiler. I mean, that's in the trailer of, you know, it is a creature feature, essentially, because it's not just say, oh, maybe they exist. And is it in your mind or not? 
and they look really uh they're just i, I enjoy watching them uh talk about what was the process of making these creatures like uh how did you use much practical effects was it digital a mix of everything well we kind of used um a hybrid so i was very keen you know i was looking back at a movie called uh, cat's eye mm -hmm. a stephen king adaptation which you might remember and remember the third story in cat's eye was drew barrymore and she has a confrontation with this little goblin what i always really liked about that goblin was he it was a an actor you know wearing a costume and he was running around on a giant set i mean a really giant set so he gets on a huge roller co a roller skate that they've built and gets in a, I think a fish bowl and, you know, he, there's all these enormous things. And I, what I really liked is he felt like they'd photographed something very tangible, you know, and a lot of the modern goblins, I mean, some of them are amazing creatures, little, you know, goblinish creatures. A lot of them are incredible, but when they move and they run and they jump and they fight things and they interact, sometimes you can see, I feel like you can see that they're not really there, that the gravity doesn't seem quite right. They don't really seem like the right weight. And when they, the movement doesn't seem quite truthful and you can just sort of sense that they're not really there. Um, but on the other hand, when you think back to the old photograph movies like Cat's Eye or, the, or a big inspiration for this film was Joe Dante's movie Gremlins. The close-ups of the Gremlins, you know, I love Gremlins. It's a brilliant movie. The close-up of the Gremlins now, you know, they don't quite hold up to scrutiny really, do they? They're a bit rubbery looking and, the eyes don't blink quite correctly and, you know, they just don't really look real. So what I wanted to, to do both. So what we've got in our movie, um, there's a movie who comes into the, into the leading lady's house. There's a goblin comes into the leading lady's house and he comes through the French doors at the back of her living room. And when he reaches up to pull the handle on that French door, we built a double height set. So we built double height sets for all the times where you see the goblins. So that French door, which in real life is six feet tall, is actually 12 feet tall. Oh, cool. A full-size yeah. actor there wearing a, a mask. And when you when that actor comes into close-up, um, we photograph the mask, obviously, but the mask didn't move. It was completely static. Mm. And then we had an actor, uh, a guy called Rick Warden, who um, is a character actor in the UK, and he's a, an old friend of mine I went to school with. He played all of the goblins so he played their faces and their voices and we motion captured his face so he had all the little dots on his face and he gave the performance and then that was animated back over the mask so using the photograph mask as a reference the cg guys animated the mouth and the eyes and the nostrils and everything else yeah they look so, awesome yeah yeah so i think what what results is you get because they were using what we actually shot that looked exactly the way it should as a reference for the CG. The CG is extremely realistic. And of course, then you get in the wides and when the goblins are moving around, that's actually people jumping around on real stuff. Um, so I think they look that looks really real as well. And then we used motion control cameras to map the move. So when the camera moves in the big set, we'd have to do a half size move on the small set. And, you know, it was kind of complicated, but I'm really pleased with how they look. I think they look, uh, they, they, you get the best of both worlds, I think. And I think a lot of people who've seen the film are struggling to know how he did them and they think they're puppets, you know. But I, I, I was say, watching that too, yeah. Because those like medium shots on them, it's like maybe, uh, but I absolutely yeah. agree. It's like you said, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah, I mean, I think if they were puppets, it would have been crazily expensive. Mm. But also, we could never have got them to be as expressive as they are with their faces and voices. You just couldn't. I don't think that's possible with puppets because they they really have personalities and characters. And Rick, who, pl who played all of their voices, worked incredibly hard on giving them all backstories. And he worked with the actors who played. So he's playing the face and the voice, but he worked with the actors who play the bodies the stuntmen and he really drilled them in how to walk and you know you walk like this and you're very you're very angry and aggressive you're called the enforcer and he gave them all names and <laughs> he went pretty you know he went he went quite nerdy on it um, all right yeah but i think you know uh, probably when you first watch the film you just see 
a variety of goblins, but they're actually all behaving very much in character and doing all the things they should be doing. Yeah. And, and then on the other side of the things, you have quite a wonderful and eclectic cast of humans. Yeah. Tell me about the the cast you have and how did they, how did you bring them onto this project? Well, we have, I think we have a fantastic cast. You know, we've got Hannah John Kamen in the lead, who's sort of, star, whose star is rising. And rightly, I think she's a brilliant actress. She, she, I knew she was good when I hired her. I mean, I was really pleased to have gotten her. I guess working with her, I kind of realized, okay, she's the real thing. You know, she's actually got movie star quality. You know, she's brilliant. And I think she, what, what I loved about what Hannah did is, you know, on the surface of it, this is, could be construed as a kind of schlocky creature feature, but she didn't treat it like that. She treated it like a, a drama, you know, and she played it for real. And she said, okay, I'm going to really play the truth of how you would react if you saw these creatures in your house and how you would react if your life was really threatened. And, you know, I think she, she went for it. And every day on set, she would blow me away with something she did or, She's, I mean, she's really excellent actress. I think it's just a shame for her that she's given such a good performance in a, a genre movie, because you know, sadly, it will never get recognized um, by the awards people, or that's just not how these things work. But um, as she does, you know, it's a really good performance. And then we have Doug Booth playing Jamie, her husband, and he, um, one thing I've been saying about Doug is it, it, it paradoxically and ironically takes a, a man of great courage to play a coward <laughs> <laughs> as as honestly as Doug plays him. So Doug plays a guy who's really, really frightened. And when he wants to be an alpha male and he wants to step up to the plate, but he just doesn't have it in him. And he completely collapses, which is something you don't um, see very often in a film, I don't think. It's realistic then, too, because some people you think, oh yeah, I could totally do this in the moment. I'm going to be ready, but you will ne you'll never know until you're there. And it's a very possible option that, yeah, you can't do anything. And so it was nice to have that kind of vulnerability of like, well, no, yeah. he couldn't do much. Well, I th exactly. And when I've been in situations where very stressful things have happened, you know, I can think of <clears throat> when I was on a set once and a scaffold collapsed in a, in a gale. Oh my! It blew across a, a car park and smashed through a windshield. And um, some people leapt up into action and were on it, and they actually risked their lives. Um, when we mm. watched it back on a security camera afterwards, we saw that they were nearly one of them was very nearly killed by a huge scaffold thing flying through the oh, air. Wow. But other people just froze. You know, they were overwhelmed. They were completely the panic and the fear just wipe them out and they weren't able to do anything, you know? And I, th I think, unfortunately, the truth is, the real truth is a lot of people in a life or death situation are not gonna cope, you know? They're just gonna lose it. Um, and that's not what you get in movies. When we went and looked for other examples of this, it was quite hard to find them. You know, we found uh, the guy in the Coen Brothers movie, Miller, Miller's Crossing, yeah. who really pleads, you know, pathetically for his life. and. There's a movie called Gangster Number One that we found, but there's, there aren't many examples. There's a, there's a million more examples of the Marvel moment, you know, where the camera pushes in and the guy steps forward and he says some kind of cool one-liner, you know. And to me, that's that's not really real. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in amongst this film, which is obviously very fantastical and far-fetched, we've grounded it, I think, in a kind of quite a realistic drama about violence and courage and cowardice. Yeah. And then the rest of your cast, you have some other uh, yeah, yeah. So parts of the got, ensemble. We've got a fabulous Irish cast as well. Um, so led by Colm Meany, who plays Daddy Whelan, who's the sort of uh, toxic alpha male. He runs an Irish building firm with his dysfunctional family. Mm -hmm. and we also have Christian Nairn from Game of Thrones. We have uh, Chris Wally, who's quite famous in the UK, um, for a TV show he does here. And Jamie O'Donnell's the same. She plays uh, his sister. And these are, you know, uh, pretty big actors in in the UK and Ireland. And they, yeah, we, I mean, we shot for the moon on the cast, really. And I think 
one of the positives about shooting in the pandemic was that uh, those people were available and they were they were at home and really wanting to go to work. So yeah. uh, we were very lucky, I think. And we got, um, I think, you know, um, the goblins in the movie take a real sort of gleeful pleasure in what they do. Yes. So they, and I think there's some fun to be had in that. It depends on your personality and how you react to that when you watch the film. But for me, at least, it, I think that's really fun and kind of entertaining in a dark way how crazy they are and how how little morality they've got and they don't really care they love it you know and the irish family are the same you know they they take a real pleasure in being the bad guys they don't care about mm. that they are out for number one and they look after their family and everybody else can go to hell and they you know they got problems that family um but what i what i enjoy is i think all the Irish actors are having real fun, you know, and I think, uh, you know, it was a very fun, funny set and they had a lot of, um, they really entertained themselves playing those characters and they decided, you know, I think what they all enjoyed was, okay, we don't have to be sympathetic, you know, we don't have to be likable. Right. We can just, we can just um, go to the truth of what these horrible people are actually like and what they're all about. And yeah, they had a lot of fun. But yeah, I think um, it's it's appropriate that the film is coming out in the states quite near to St. Patrick's Day. Oh yeah, March seventeenth. It's coming to VOD. In case anybody start writing oh. down on your calendar, uh, yeah. you were mentioning how much fun on set. Something too with your cast. There's so much physicality. There's a lot of yeah. stunt work, a lot of movement, a lot of action. Uh, how much were they able to do, and how did you accomplish that? Because you know you don't want to hurt your cast. Well, we had a, a brilliant stunt coordinator called um, Nick Chopping, who's an old friend of mine, and he used to play Ron Weasley in the Harry Potter movies. Um, so he worked really hard with all of the people that wanted to do their own fights and stunts, and which is most of them. Mm -hmm. And the goblins themselves are all stunt performers, you know, working under Nick's supervision. But there was a lot of rehearsing and practicing, and people like Doug, for example, and Hannah, really were quite keen that, can I do as much as possible? So in a lot of those fights where you see people wrestling and punching and stabbing and hitting each other with frying pans and all the stuff that happens in the film, uh, they really are doing it. And um, yeah, it's pretty, I think it's pretty fun when the actors actually do it and it's not doubles. Yeah, it's, it really felt like they were all in it and yeah, that way to strategically do it. So everybody stays safe, but has a fun time. Uh, yeah. Another facet of fun, but a different outlook. What was something that maybe was like a happy accident? You know, you didn't plan it to happen, but it worked out for the better for you. Uh, well, I suppose because we were shooting close to the pandemic, we're very keen. Everybody was very keen to keep it very contained, you know? Mm. So my initial approach would have been let's go to Ireland and we'll find a an old house there and we'll shoot in that house and we'll shoot in the surrounding area but what we ended up doing was building a house in, in an airfield so we actually put up a, a huge uh, soundstage um, which was a kind of a gig tent so there, there was hmm. a, a company who would normally put up gig venues for uh, bands you know rock bands and they were completely out of work because nobody was going to anything like that so they very helpfully helped us put up a massive stage and inside that stage we built an entire house you know now i don't think under normal circumstances that would have happened at all and the, the um that gave us an incredible control you know and we were able we were able to um destroy that house <laughs> at the end of the movie which is which right. is um there's a lot of destruction, that is for sure. There's a lot of destruction. We we just we just got on with it because it was a set we could destroy it. But also it gives you like um a real control over your lighting and how you shoot. And so I, I I feel like the film has a real it's very deliberate. And I always thought of it when I, when we were right from the beginning, I thought of it as a dark fairy tale for adults. Mm. So, you know, 
not a fairy tale in the way that people normally think about them nowadays as, as for kids, but kind of in the old fairy tales before the Victorians came in and censored them, they were quite dark and, you know, like a Grimm's fairy tale, quite dark and quite bloody and quite scary and shocking at times in the storytelling, but with all these really great images and sort of atmospheres that I personally really enjoy. And I, th I wanted to make something that felt like a, felt like a fairy tale, but had elements of, you know, blood and guts and terror and suspense and all the things that you can only have as an adult. Um, yeah, and I think we've achieved that. We've really pushed the look of the movie, you know, so it has that sort of dream, dreamy, dreamlike quality um, that, you know, maybe is reminiscent, I don't know, of some Tim Burton movies or, you know, you know what I'm, do you know what I mean? Yeah, there's kind of a, well, the inconvenience of circumstances of the world making you have to be in this kind of bubble really gave it a unique quality because then it really feels like you're in this isolated world because it is a very isolated house. And then that's another theme that comes up of kind of that isolation. Well, what do you do? Help is not going to get to you that fast. No. Are you going to, you know, do something about it or are you going to let it happen to you? Yeah. It's one of those things where you go, and, if you go and stay in a remote place and you've got that lovely sense of isolation, but then maybe last thing at night when you're kind of locking the back door and you pull the curtains, you think there's literally nobody here. You know, there's just that inky black outside. Yep. And who knows who's out there or who could be out there. And, you know, you don't want to think about that too much when you go to bed. So it's, yes, it's, <laughs> Exactly, exactly that. But yeah, um, too I, many I, windows at that house for me. I'd be like, <laughs> board yeah, that up. Someone's gonna break those. Exactly. So yeah. yeah, I guess um, I'm Irish by birth, so I don't sound Irish. But um, I was born in Ireland to Irish parents. I have Irish passport. And, yeah. Um, I, I suppose I was there as a child, and then I visited Ireland in summers and had these kind of brilliant summers on my grandfather's farm and. I suppose for, I romanticize Ireland really a yeah. bit um, because of that. It seems I've always thought of it as a bit of a, a magical place. And because the bit I went to was very rural and in the middle of nowhere, it always felt like quite a wild place to me as well, like a very beautiful, yeah. countrified, wild place. And I suppose that is in partly in the story, you know, whereas it starts in London and London's quite kind of, grim and then and then when you go to Ireland it becomes more magical and there's a sort of sense that it's a very uh, beautiful kind of special place where magical things can happen and I suppose that's how I how I feel about Ireland a little bit I'm not sure that the people who live there feel exactly the same way I do think Ireland is I do think Ireland is has a kind of a magic about it actually oh yeah and it's Certainly. just and just the cinematography you have of it too, the you know your the drone shot kind of look is very beautiful, and you're going into this massive countryside. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Epic. Epic. Yeah, that's what yes. we were going for. Was trying to give that sense of scale and, mm. and try to capture how beautiful some of those places are. Yeah. Nice. Is there anything else you'd like to add for people going into who are going to go check out your film? Well, all I all I would say is it's um, when we were making it, we thought of it as a roller coaster. So I think on the way up, you've got the kind of bit where the the ratchet thing is clacking and dragging you up the up the slope, and mm. you know, you, gradually, gradually, the tension's starting to build, and we just ratchet it up degree by degree by degree, and then eventually, in the final third of the movie, we go over the top and we drop you, you know. And I think all I would say, I guess, is it's worth the wait. Um, enjoy the view on the way up and enjoy the fun that the actors are having. Um, but know that when you get to that final section, it's going to be pretty intense and lots of thrills and spills and blood and guts. And I, th I think for me anyway, a lot of fun. I mean, I got to, I got to make the movie that I wanted to make. I think, you know, probably a lot of times when you see someone promoting a movie, they maybe didn't get to make the film they wanted to make because mm you know, the financiers and the people involved um, pushed it one way or pushed it in a different direction. But I, I really think maybe this would be the only time in my career that this happens. I don't know. But I felt like I just got to do 
do it for myself. You know, like I just want to, I'm just going to make the film that I want to make. Um, I want to make a kind of a, a cult movie, you know, mm. I want to make a movie that's weird in a good way, not weird for its own sake, but weird for the story's sake. But it, if it wants to go somewhere, it goes somewhere. And I think as a result, the film is very deliberate and, and done very particularly and has a particular tone and it had it yep. right from the start. As soon as we saw the rushes, it was like, oh, it's got this sort of atmosphere that's very specific. I, I personally, I don't think it's quite like other films. So even so far it's been released in England and some of the things people have written about it, some people really get it and they're like, they've understood it. And I know they've understood it from what they've written. And I think some people just don't get it really. Uh, and I'm kind of seeing it upside down or back to front. And it's sort of, um, I guess that's the cult movie, isn't it? That's the definition of it. Sure. Um, so this is something very different to the big blockbusters, the Marvels and the Disneys. And the, this is not that. If you want something a little bit um, different for St. Patrick's Day, maybe, something very Irish and very different, uh, this is your movie. But All you're right. Probably, uh, yeah, you're probably a um, better place to say wh why people should go than I am. But. Well, I, I think you summed that up perfectly. I mean, it comes out right around yeah. St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for talking with me about your film. My pleasure. It's nice talking to you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I was going to say, everybody, stick around for a moment. We're going to do a quick spoiler question after oh, this. Yeah. But, um, yeah, um, but if you're signing off now and you haven't seen the film, thank you for watching. I'm Carrie Lane and stick around if you want a spoiler thing or come back later after you watch the movie. Okay, so spoilers. If you're here still, we're spoilers. Okay, so the end end. Uh, just briefly tell me your thought on it. And I know directors will be, you know, it could be audience interpretation, but I'd be curious on your thoughts. Uh, I feel she's embraced this uh essentially power you know she has this energy and power yeah. from these things um but yeah. i was curious on your thoughts yeah i mean it's meant to be a happy ending um i think it is a happy ending in a way it kind of a screwed up uh, kind of a horror happy ending so it's it's sure a bit twisted and a bit wrong but it's right at the same time yeah so yeah she's um she's become mother red cap she is the queen she is their queen Mm. And um, what was really important for me was that we showed that Jamie, her husband, is on board with that. And he gives her a look and he says, yes, you know, he, he, he supports her becoming that. And that for me, you know, because there's another version where he's thinking, what the hell has happened, you know, to my life? Who are these little goblins? Why are they here? You know, but he yeah. understands that's part of her journey and she... He can't be the protector and the provider and the, the alpha. He's not got it in him. And that's his journey is working out that he's just not capable. Yeah. It's not, it's not in his, in his personality. So she takes that role, you know, and she has her, um, her gang of new friends who are going to help her achieve that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a quite a thing to shoot. I've never really, shot anything quite as out there as that and um you know i've done a lot of mainstream television which is you know gets big audiences and is hmm. very you know has a big team of people working on it and i thought you know if this was a tv show i'd have somebody at my elbow tugging saying <laughs> you gotta stop you know you can't do it like this this isn't right yep. so i felt um very free, but yeah, I really, you know, I mean, the blood everywhere and and um, the sort of insanity of it just felt like a, a really crazy scene in a good way. Yeah. I, I felt like I was sort of um, inspired by the ending of Hereditary and the ending of Midsummer and the fact that I couldn't see those endings coming and I really wanted to make something that, the um the ending felt right and made sense and you understood how you got there but you could never predict it and i don't right. i don't believe after 
um, the scene in the forest under the ground, uh, I don't think anybody could guess what comes next. I don't believe. Maybe they could. I'd be very interested to meet someone if they said, yeah, I guessed it. I saw that coming. I knew that that was going to happen. But um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's surprising. And again, I think it's an antidote to the formula of the big blockbusters where I quite often feel I've seen this story before. And when I'm watching it, I kind of go, okay, it's one of two endings. It's either going to go A or B. Mm. Well, and, I think oh, you summarized it well of saying it's a horror happy ending. So, yeah. yes. Exactly. It, you know it's happy. You know it's good. You know it's right. But at the same time, it feels very wrong. It's, yeah, it's a bit, <laughs> mm. <laughs> You're like, <Not> yay. <laughs> like, okay, we're all good. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much for uh, talking about that bit. And if you stuck through the spoilers, let us know what you thought of how, well, I was going to say, don't maybe no comments on that yet, but you know. Uh, mess reach out to this guy and let him know what you thought but yeah cool thank you i thought that was very it's a spectacle of an ending and i think it ends well for her and for him because sometimes those horror endings of the movies you mentioned i don't know if us as an audience sits there going yay good for them this feels a bit more like okay we are on this ride yeah exactly so, and i think yeah. if you want to if you want to put your characters through the ringer, you know, we put yeah. them through the mill, we give them like a pretty rough ride, don't we? Right. So I think if you're going to do that, then maybe that's the right, that feels to me like the right ending. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you again so much. Thank you. No, it's nice talking to you. Yeah, likewise.